Welcome back. We have a contested Republican primary in the 80th district that represents parts of Blair County, including Hollidaysburg, the Cove, Tyrone and Bellwood. And today, one of the candidates in that race who is challenging incumbent Jim Gregory is Scott Barger. Scott, thank you so much for joining Jordan, us. Jordan, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So obviously there is an incumbent Republican. You're yes. running to challenge him. Yes, sir. Why did you decide to get in the race? To me, it was a matter of voting record. Uh, Representative Gregory over the last year specifically made votes that I don't I didn't agree with personally as a conservative and I don't think really reflect the values of the people who live in the 80th district. So that gave me the motivation initially to throw my hat into the ring. Now, obviously, you know, both you and Representative Gregory kind mm -hmm. of have a, a history. You guys worked together at the radio sure station. Did. Sure so, did. So so what really put you over the edge that that made you want to challenge uh, Representative Gregory? To me, initially, it was the nomination for a Democrat Speaker of the House that decision uh, to hand over the speaker's gavel to the Democrats cost the conservative agenda, uh, specifically uh, the opportunity to get voter ID in the, in the Keystone State, which to me was key. And from there, after I looked at his voting record, I said, you know, I, th I think we can do better. I think it's time for a change. I want to talk about that. That's something you've kind of harped on in your campaign and some of your supporters have harped on. Sure. That vote yes. for Representative Rossi to sure. be the kind of interim speaker, because mm -hmm. if you you and I both know eventually the Democrats were going to have that Absolutely, majority. Yeah. So my question is why, I don't know if the word is demagogue this issue, but why use this issue and harp on it when in reality, the Demo like making that decision didn't hand it over really to the Democrats. They were going to have it after no, a special it, election it, anyway. It was a, it was a choice between letting, letting them have the speaker's gavel for two years or 22 months. Mm -hmm. And to me, I would choose 22 months because certainly we can get something done, specifically voter ID, in those six or eight weeks that we had control of the House. But if we play out that scenario, let's sure. say you were in his seat, yes. okay, and you had that vote. Other, 15 other Republicans also voted right. for Margaret, including leadership like Brian Cutler. Sure. So you would have voted for Carl Metzger, potentially, and Rossi still would have ended up in that seat. Absolutely. So I guess my question is, how big of it is an issue if it wouldn't have really made an impact regardless in that situation? Well, I think at that point, you also have to consider the people who live in the 80th. It's not just a political maneuver to elect a Speaker of the House. It's also a representative voice. What did what do people in the 80th district want us to do? Would they want us to hand the gavel over to the Democrats early or hold on to it for another two months and try to get work done? My personal opinion is they would want us to hold on to that gavel as long as we could to try to get some stuff done. So another thing that you've been criti uh, criticizing Representative Gregory on is that like conservative rec record. Right. What part of Jim Gregory's record do you think wasn't conservative enough? Other than the initial vote, to me, I, it, it's concerning that there were some votes that uh, didn't reflect what the pro-life movement would like to accomplish in uh, the United States, specifically in the Keystone State. There was some funding sent to Pitt University, even though they refused to back away from their fetal tissue research. That was concerning. There were some votes with the unions and against uh, the Republicans for a prevailing wage bill. That kind of stuff doesn't reflect our values uh, earlier, at, at, before, you know, at the end of, say, 2022, there was a vote against a constitutional amendment that would limit how fast the state can grow our budget, which I think is a strong fiscally conservative vote. He voted against that one. Um, those kind of things, you know, paint a picture over time of, you know, maybe now that the Democrats are in charge and pushing more Democratic legislation through, perhaps we have a representative in the 80th is going to go along more often than he should. Now, I, I want to touch on two of the issues that you brought sure. up here, including the abortion issue. Yeah. Now, one of the things his campaign has pushed back on you specifically sure. is some comments that you may have made on the radio. Mm -hmm. He has posted these clips. Right. So where do you stand on the abortion issue in that radio clip? If you haven't seen, it sounds like you say that you wait for a fetus to have brain function before you consider it a viable life. Where do you stand on abortion? Is it at con does life begin at conception or where does it stand for you? I to me. All, all life from conception to natural death is, is, is sacred and deserves full legal protection. Um, that, the, the issue at hand of, you know, okay, given that starting point, where do you go? What do you allow for in case, for example, in ex, uh, the case of uh, life of the mother or rape or incest? Those kind of things raise philosophical questions, which I believe that quote we were trying to get at, you know, when, when do we draw the line or not? Legally, where do we personally feel we should be? But, but to me, the pro-life movement, look, Jordan, it's a, it's a broad tent, right? And we want as many pro-life people to be in that tent as possible. Some Republicans, even Donald Trump, 
go way outside and say, you know, hey, there's all kinds of exceptions, you know, there's three exceptions to this. I personally wouldn't agree with that, but I don't want to kick him out of the movement. I think we should have as many people in the movement as possible because the battle at hand for the next two years, I believe, isn't exceptions at the beginning of pregnancy. It has to do with what is Planned Parenthood looking to do? What are the Democrats looking to do if we don't take back the House? So to me, I, I feel very strongly that, that a pro-life movement should include all sorts of people, whether they allow for personal exceptions or not. So then finally, I know I'm being told to wrap, but I want to ask one last question. Sure. The other issue brought up was support for unions. I will say this has been an evolving mm -hmm. issue. There are conservative Republicans who have evolved on this issue and mm -hmm. have tried to garner support from unions. In your Lincoln dinner speech, you were pretty anti-organized labor yes. when you came out. So do you stand by that? And do you think possibly, I mean, with Republicans, even like Donald Trump, he's kind of, he went out to try to get the Teamsters vote. Mm -hmm. He went after UAW as mm -hmm. well as endorsement. Do you think it could be a mistake to alienate I do organized not. labor? I do not, because whereas I, I appreciate the declared purpose of what a union should be, protecting the rights of workers, I mean, who doesn't want workers' rights to be protected? These unions have gone outside of their lane and have gotten involved in politically progressive ideas that I think we should, as Republicans, should be against. Would you support right-to-work legislation? Absolutely. To give people, you mean to give people the choice whether they belong to a union or not? Absolutely. Okay. Scott Barker, thank you so much for joining us. Scott, you are running against incumbent Jim Gregory we in the 80th yes. District primary, and we will have those results and full coverage on primary election day, April 23rd, because we are your local election headquarters.